Terror sits at the door of many countries in and around Islamic State's declared caliphate. Joining us now as we examine the impact this presence is having on the region, in Washington, D.C., Ali Al Ahmed, scholar with the Institute for Gulf Affairs. Also in Washington, via Skype, Hussein Ibish, senior fellow with the American Task Force on Palestine. And with us here in studio, Janice Stein, TVO's foreign affairs analyst, founding director of the U of T's Monk School of Global Affairs. And we are happy to welcome Janice, you back from Florida. Yes. Look at that tan. From a week's vacation. Indeed, good for you. And uh, to our two gentlemen friends in Washington, D.C., we're glad to have you on the program again as well. Sheldon, can we just start uh, by having you bring up the map to show the latest on ISIS? Here are the areas that ISIS controls, and here are the areas that ISIS has support in the black areas of control, the red areas where they are supported. Of course, the news of the last couple of weeks is the killing of that Jordanian pilot in a most excruciatingly appalling fashion. In addition, the 21 Egyptian Copts uh, being beheaded as well. It seems to indicate, Hussein, that ISIS doesn't mind making new enemies. No, Why would that be? Right. I'm sorry. I think I think you're exactly right about that. They don't mind making new enemies, but they relish it. Uh, they thrive off of conflict, and uh, what they need, of course, is to operate in uh, chaotic areas. They they rely on on these areas where no government writ runs. So, like parts of Libya now, but also uh, <clears throat> northern and eastern Syria and western Iraq. So that as long as there's chaos, uh, they can operate. Once they start operating, they thrive off of um, enemies, and particularly pose as the champions of the local Sunni populations, uh, particularly in Iraq and Syria, against uh, both ideological and especially sectarian religious enemies. So the idea uh, they uh, put out to their um, uh, the public in the areas that they control is, um, first of all, we, we are your best uh, line of support against being killed by Shiites and Alawites and others. And number two, if you don't accept our rule, we'll kill you as well. So uh, just keep quiet and under us, you'll be safe. Ali, would you add to that? Because it seems on the face of it not to make sense that if you want to spread your wings, as it were, you want fewer enemies, not more enemies. Why does ISIS want more enemies? Because I think this is uh, really, it's fulfilling its own ideological uh, uh, drivers, which, me, which re really states that the whole world is against us. The only uh, uh, friends are our people. The rest are enemies that should be killed. And this is stated in the uh, the ideological, the Wahhabi ideological foundation of ISIS, uh, who uh, see their enemy, uh, forget Iraq and Syria for a second, and go to Libya, which there is no sectarian question, there is no uh, 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 tribal question even, but that language remains that if you are not part of our uh, regime, you are an apostate, you are not a true Muslim and you deserve to die, and that is really ideological, it has to do with the history. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we would be writing about is this sort of this component, which we call the uh, uh, unlimited violence. That is a key driver for, for ISIS to spread its, uh, you know, to gain territory. And this is not, not, not nothing new. This is, again, this is part of the uh, ideological, the Wahhabi ideological uh, foundation that terror and unlimited violence creates an opportunity for you to make uh, uh, territorial gains easier than, than uh, many, uh, many uh, other things, in, like, like being uh, actually ideologically correct. Janice, let me get you to pick up on the first thing that Ali mentioned there, and that is Libya. How does the ISIS strategy play itself out now in Libya? Well, it's very interesting because, as Ali just said, there really is no sectarian divide in Libya. It's a Sunni population, uh, along with Berbers uh, that come from North Africa, certainly, but it's overwhelmingly Sunni. So there's no Sunni-Shia There's no Sunni-Shia divide, split, right. that's right, which we do see in Syria with the Alawites, and we certainly see in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, we do hear the same language of exclusion. Uh, and Libya offers, in a sense, a wonderful platform for ISIS right now particularly in the southwestern part of the country, Steve. Yeah. Uh, right now in Libya, we have a, 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 a fractured failed state, two competing governments, uh, essentially with their seats along the coast of Tripoli and controlling maybe 45 or 50 percent of Libya's territory. The whole southwest is ungoverned. 
This is ideal recruiting and basing strategy for ISIS, and that's exactly what's happening. And if you think about where the southwestern part of Libya is on that map that you uh, put up, it reaches not only back to the ISIS-controlled areas, but forward Nigeria, Mali, Chad, Niger, all of these are being destabilized by groups that are operating now in the Libyan desert, and especially with arms that have flown out of Libya once all of Muammar Gaddafi's strongholds were opened up. Now, let me ask you about that. Quick sort of tangential follow-up, which is so much of the world cheered when Gaddafi was killed and overthrown, then killed. Uh, maybe not such a bright idea in hindsight? Well, he, he, the consequences of that have been disastrous. Let me put it that way. But that raises a bigger question. Uh, it's not the overthrowing of the dictators that are that is the problem in this part of the world. It's the dictators that are this part of the world that are the problem, and the recovery from them is a very long, arduous recovery. Uh, and these premature celebrations that we've seen ignore uh, the challenges that this part of the world is is facing. Okay, Ali, let's go back to that map then, where we t focused overwhelmingly on Syria and Iraq. And let me ask you whether you think. ISIS's long-range plan is to destroy these two countries. What's your view? Uh, the, uh, this is the, really uh, the essence of uh, ISIS uh, creation. Uh, I want to comment on Janice's uh, uh, answer is we, we do uh, uh, talk about the, the effect of the falling dictators, but these uh, effects are uh, continued and enhanced by standing right. dictators. And what happens in Libya and what's happening in Iraq in terms of destroying these countries is a result of standing dictators who created ISIS to create the, to protect themselves, number one, and to create the, the impression that if you, if you bring a dictator down or if you try to build an alternative model, this is what you're going to get. That's why you're here in the Gulf. You, you don't, do you want to be like Syria? Do you want to be like Iraq? To anyone who is opposing these regimes in the Gulf, this is the uh, narrative that you hear that, do you want us to end up like Iraq and Syria? Hmm. So do you feel that their goal in the short run is to destroy these two countries? Absolutely. I mean, there is no uh, goal for ISIS to build uh, a society that is stable, that's inclusive. Obviously, they are not stupid uh, to realize that in order to build a state, you need to behave like a state. And they are not behaving like a state. They are destroying almost everything in their, in their way. They are destroying mosques, Sydney mosques. They are destroying uh, cultural sites. They are destroying almost everything that they can destroy and killing even Sunni population for the smallest thing. I watched the video of execution of uh, a few dozen Sunnis in Tikrit a couple of weeks ago. So they are really trying to destroy the fabric, the economic, the, uh, the social fabric of every country. So these countries will not rise to challenge and, provide, uh, pro and uh, become a threat to the standing dictators in the Gulf uh, and the region. Janice, follow up? You know, I agree with, with Ali that their objective is to destroy. But I think we need to distinguish between their objective and the likelihood of success. I don't think ISIS has the capacity to do that. Uh, I think yes we, or ever 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 I think your map actually shows how small the areas are yeah. that ISIS controls as time goes on it becomes more and more difficult for ISIS as Sunni Arab populations react against the cruelty and the violence that they're seeing so I think it's important that while we take ISIS seriously we not over exaggerate the threat to the Middle East Actually, I think ISIS is a short-term problem, unlike the long-term problems that Ali has been talking about. Well, Hussein, can you explain how it makes any sense for ISIS to be killing Sunnis? Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, they are, a, uh, as we keep hearing from uh, both Janice and Ali and, and everyone, really, who talks about ISIS, they are an exclusivist organization. They are a vanguardist organization. They don't uh, claim to represent the majority of, of uh, Muslims or even of Sunni Muslims. They claim to, to represent a pure form of Islam, uh, one that harkens back to uh, the earliest periods in Islamic history. This is, of course, completely false, but that's what they claim. And they set themselves up against 
uh, the, the overwhelming majorities and against the status quo. So they're not only against Iraq and Syria and trying to destroy them and refuse to use the names of these countries. They, they, the uh, ISIS plan is to obliterate the entire state system in the region, all of it, uh, and to replace it with something radically different, which is this, this dream of this caliphate. It's a, a bizarre thing, but that's what they want. Uh, and so everyone who opposes that has to go. And this has rather deep roots in uh, radical Islamist discourse, at least going back to Sayyid Qutb, a very radical Muslim brotherhood thinker. In the 1960s, in, in, in an Egyptian prison, he wrote a book called Milestones, in which he said that the Muslim Brotherhood was trying to make uh, Muslim countries and Arab countries more Islamic, but that was wrong because none of them were Islamic at all. They were all in a state of what he called jahiliya, in other words, pre-Islamic ignorance, like Sodom and Gomorrah basically would be a, hmm. a Christian version of that. And I think ISIS has taken that idea and brought it right up to the present day. If you're not a, with them, you're an apostate, you should be killed. If you represent the status quo or any aspect of it, uh, it's not Islamic, it's jahiliya, and it should be destroyed and you should be killed. So so, I mean, the radicalism of it, the extremism and the stridency is exactly their stock in trade. Ali, though, uh, you know, as people watch this and they, they're thinking to themselves, well, wait a second, I thought ISIS was a Sunni group and therefore they, they had it out for the Shia, but now they're killing Sunnis as well. I'm confused. Can you help people, well, you know, maybe amplify on Hussein's answer and explain how that makes any sense that they want to kill fellow Sunnis? I want to just take issue with Hussein's description. Uh, ISIS is not a Muslim Brotherhood movement. They do not use Sayyid Qutbs. They don't. Okay, they are not Muslim Brotherhood. They do not quote Sayyid Qutb. They quote Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. I know. They use his methodology, his approach, his language. The books that are printed by the Saudi government. These are the books that are distributed and taught are used to be in the uh, ISIS camps, religious camps. So, uh, they follow, uh, what they follow Deji more than anybody else. Uh, the management of savagery is probably their most important source. But they do, they are influenced by a Qutubist dialogue. Surely you would accept that, no? No, no. no uh, I, you know, this is true well, for Al-Nusra and Al-Qaeda, not for ISIS. I think there is okay, a difference just, between. Okay, Ali, between finish ISIS, your point, please. Yeah. Uh, there is a there is a, a, a huge difference between ISIS and Al-Nusra. That's why you see Al-Nusra and ISIS are slitting each other's throat and raping each other's women because they are not of the same ideological uh, 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 source. Uh, ISIS, if you see, and I read them and I follow them, and I'm writing a paper, a major paper on them, their ideological uh, uh, interpretation of Islam is that of the Wahhabi Salafi, Najdi. Uh, and Nusra and Al-Qaeda branches, that is Muslim Brotherhood rooted, yes, absolutely. Uh, the uh, I, I forgot the question because I was trying just to address. Uh, I really. Uh, what was the your question? No, well, I'm going to I'm going to move us along because I think we've had a good a good go down on that one. But because uh, I was interrupted. So. Yes, I know. And Hussein, we love having you on the program, but you can't interrupt Ali all the time. Okay. okay? Very good. Yeah. No, I just wanted to clarify what I was saying. I understand. I understand. I want to now have a shift focus to what was I suspect the most controversial speech given in the entire world yesterday. It happened in the United States, in Washington, by the Israeli Prime Minister. Roll tape, please. And don't be fooled. The battle between Iran and ISIS doesn't turn Iran into a friend of America. Iran and ISIS are competing for the crown of militant Islam. One calls itself the Islamic Republic. The other calls itself the Islamic State. Both want to impose a militant Islamic empire, first on the region, and then on the entire world. They just disagree among themselves who will be the ruler of that empire. In this deadly game of thrones, there's no place for America or for Israel, no peace for Christians, Jews, or Muslims who don't share the Islamist medieval creed, no rights for women, no freedom for anyone. So when it comes to Iran and ISIS, the enemy of your enemy is your enemy. I'm tempted to make a comment here about the reference to an HBO series that is very popular, but Game let's leave that. Thrones. Let's leave that aside. How much of that speech do you sign on to? Uh, 
I, I think that there is a, a misstatement of the identity between uh, Iran and ISIS. Um, ISIS is, as we've all just said, you know, is an extreme militant, fundamentalist version uh, that derives its roots from Wahhabi Islam that originated in, in Saudi Arabia. I Iran uh, is now uh, more than 40 years into a Shia revolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there are certainly early radical days uh, in Iran when Ayatollah Khomeini first came to power. I think we all remember the hostage taking and there were very strong militant strains. What we've certainly seen over 40 years, Steve, is an Iran that behaves just as much like a state as it does a militant ideology. And so I don't think we can draw any convergence between Iran on the one hand and ISIS on the other. Hussein Ibish, how much of that Netanyahu speech do you want to sign on to? Pretty well zero, I would say. Um, it, it's a glib rhetorical thing, Islamic Republic, Islamic State. Well, you, you know, there are people on the far left, critics of Israel, who've been doing the same thing, saying, well, Islamic State, Jewish State, haha, -ha, Netanyahu. You know, it just, it's also ridiculous. So, I mean, these efforts to conflate everybody with ISIS, and Netanyahu was doing this, and, and other uh, people around him, uh, Ariel Sharon certainly, uh, in Israel were uh, immediately post 9-11, and I mean on September 11, 2001 and September 12, 2001, coming out and saying Arafat is our bin Laden. I mean, there's, it, it's not to be taken seriously, except it's opportunistic. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think people can see, path, see through this. Iran, I think Janice is right. Iran is not a, a sub-state actor like ISIS is not an ideological movement. It's a, it's, it's a, a state that uh, uses proxies that are non-state actors that are radical groups uh, in uh, Lebanon and Iraq and Syria and elsewhere. But it itself is actually not just a state, it's a hegemonic state. And uh, it's trying to get a bigger slice of the uh, status quo pie. So it's a really completely different um, entity than ISIS. No comparison at all, in my view. Ali, having said that, uh, there is a hierarchy of countries, places, states, actors, however you'd like to describe it, in the world that ISIS wants to destroy. Israel's pretty high up the list. Uh, admittedly, we're two weeks away from an Israeli election, so it's hard to imagine Prime Minister Netanyahu not being small p political with the speech. But does he have any point to make there at all, in your view? Well, I think, you know, uh, as a... Uh, a leader of a, of a country that uh, his job is on the line, he needs to get, uh, uh, you know, and enhance his uh, winning uh, chances with these elections. So I think that speech, that was the first driver uh, of that speech because uh, obviously it is because of the elections and in a way is to reinforce. And I think there was a huge risk, a huge mistake for him to, to really to breach of this American-Israeli uh, relations, because many people in, in Washington uh, really look for the Israeli interests. But at the same time, they are Americans first. Even though some of those people in, in Congress who were uh, clapping and uh, for Mr. Uh, Netanyahu, they feel uh, betrayed in their hearts for, for this to happen, to have a, a foreign la leader, really, essentially, coming into Washington, D.C., in spite of the American president and in spite of so many Democratic leaders and basically sticking his finger in the face of the, the no, American I, I understand political you. system. And, and forgive the interruption, but, but we, you know, we don't want to turn this into a discussion about whether Netanyahu should have or should not have come to speak. But the, but the way he is trying to conflate the threat that Iran and, in his view, ISIS pose together Janice, no, can you do that? No, you, you really can't. And if you actually take that speech apart just a little bit on that one issue, Steve, the threat that he is talking about from Iran is a nuclear Iran. Mm -hmm. Nobody is worrying about a nuclear Islamic caliphate right now. That is not the threat that the Islamic State poses to the rest of the region. Does it pose a threat to Israel at all, in your view? I don't think it poses, it, it poses the same kind of threat uh, through acts of terror and acts of violence 
uh, that other radical militant groups pose. But that is not of the same order of magnitude as a nuclear armed state with deliberately hostile intentions. Which is an existential threat. Which is an existential threat. So if you just strip everything else away and look at the nature of the two threats, one a state actor, well armed with, and I'm not saying it has, I don't agree with Netanyahu about that, but putatively with nuclear weapons, that's one basket, and at the other, way down the threat ladder, uh, the risk of militant acts by ISIS uh, irregulars crossing the border. Because you fundamentally still see these guys as a bunch of guys in pickup trucks with guns, is that it? I think that these guys are, uh, have a much shorter shelf life than many other people who write about the Middle East. I think they're already contained and in a box. Yes, they have ideological adherence in the Sinai right now, which is a problem for Egypt. Yes, they have ideological adherence in Libya. Uh, and in some uh, uh, states in Africa. But fundamentally, they are already contained and they will be pushed back. Well, let me add another country to the list because some have alleged that Qatar is offering support to ISIS. And we have a, I think Qatar this is off. Qatar played an unbelievable role. Over well, let's, the last we, we've year got some tape here from CNN. Here's the Emir of Qatar responding to those accusations. Sheldon, if you would, let's roll that clip. We have a strong law against funding uh, terrorist groups, as uh, counterterrorism group um, uh, uh, operation that we take against funding uh, groups, uh, terrorist groups. We stopped. We don't accept uh, people funding terrorist groups. But as I said, there is differences between some countries of who are the terrorists and who are the uh, maybe Islamist groups, but we don't consider them as terrorists. Such as, such as uh, groups in Syria. Uh, groups in, uh, in in Libya, we believe that they're extremists, and we uh, we stop. We don't fund extremists, but there are differences. There are differences that some countries and some people that any group which is which comes from Islamic background are terrorists, and we don't accept that. Hussein, do you accept his protestations that he's not supporting ISIS at all? Well, there's no evidence that I've ever seen of direct Qatari funding for ISIS. Uh, on the other hand, it's pretty clear that there have been, uh, at, at very least, wealthy individuals from multiple different Gulf states, not just Qatar, but several different Gulf states, who have uh, managed, with or without the knowledge of their governments, again, this is something that's very, very difficult to prove, to, to, to have transferred money in the past to ISIS, and, and, and quite probably still do so, although ISIS has its own sources of income from uh, the uh, oil resources that it has uh, seized and from the banks that it has robbed, uh, with billions and billions of dollars, particularly in Mosul. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think it's clear they got uh, support. Whether they got support from governments uh, or with the knowledge of governments remains to be proven. Let me follow up with Ali on that. Uh, with another Gulf state, how much official or unofficial support for ISIS do you think there is coming out of Saudi Arabia these days? Uh, this is important because in the West and the PR machine has told us that this is private funding. Let's remember one thing. Gulf countries, all of them, are absolute monarchies. These are totalitarian regimes. Nothing happens really. Major things happen in those countries without government approval or support. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar are supporting terrorist groups. When I say terrorist groups, I'm talking about internationally classified terrorist groups like ISIS and Nusra, Al-Qaeda. And th this is government. Uh, if you look, at, for example, at Hamas, you know, and other Palestinian groups who, who have the most popular support from in the Arab street, they are not able to survive and to carry on a military, uh, 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 you know, arm without state support from Iran and other countries. Uh, Hezbollah from Iran and Syria. Uh, so there is not a single group. A sizable group, at least, that is using arms, ISIS or al-Nusra or others, who have survived for many decades without state support. These are covert, covert operations, obviously, but I can tell you, and uh, I put it in my credibility, that the Saudi government and the Qatari government and Kuwaiti government and even Jordanian government, ha with the Turks, have supported ISIS and nusra and other groups That's so they can play as a proxy for their policies. And that's why you see among ISIS and Nusra thousands of Saudis and Kuwaitis, you know, so-called jihadi John, born in Kuwait and, you know, ideological in Kuwait. 
3,000 Tunisians, but Tunisia has not funded ISIS. Yeah, 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 but, no, no, let me, let, no, let let me, me finish. Let, let, don't disrupt me, please. Don't. I'm not. I'm not. Okay? I'd like to add something. Uh, please, let me, let me finish. So, if, Go ahead. I, so I, you know, yeah, so my train of thoughts are not disconnected. So when you talk about that, you, how is Tunisia, there are 3,000 Tunisians uh, coming. It is the network, the, the Salafi Wahhabi network that was supported by the Saudi government that continued to receive Saudi government support that is unable, that enabled uh, those people to recruit young people, uh, telling them this is your faith, this is your religion. And like I said, uh, any military uh, or armed group in the region, terrorist or not, is not able to, to have and to build because this costs money. And uh, th this, these, these things come away from where? From the Gulf countries, from Qatar and Saudi Arabia and other countries. Let, okay, let me you're saying you wanted to come yeah. back on that. Yeah, I mean, if Ali has evidence, if he can demonstrate that the five, he listed five countries, or Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, uh, Jordan, and Turkey, I mean, uh, as supporting ISIS, I directly, funding ISIS. If you can demonstrate that, uh, you will be proving something that is enormous. If you can, if you can present some evidence and publish that, it will be huge. It will transform international relations. So I suggest you do that. I, I don't think and so. And if you can't, I, do I, that, I'll, then you might want I'll to be tell you. more careful. No, no, I, I'll tell you. In 2005, look, go Google. I, I ask for your viewers. Google my name and the name of Luhaydan, L-U-H-A-I-D-A-N, okay? Uh, we provided a, a, a recording of the Saudi chief justice telling Saudis to go to Iraq in 2005 to, to fight Americans and to fund, uh, and we provided that recording. I'm sorry, let me, fi let, let me finish, okay, please. I pro we provided a recording, a voice recording that was authenticated by the Chief Justice of Saudi Arabia himself, and NBC ran that recording with the story during the visit of King Abdullah with, uh, with Mr. Bush in his uh, Texas ranch. It did not change anything. Nobody called us from the State Department or the White House. In fact, Instead of them acting on this information that a senior Saudi official supporting Al-Qaeda killing its soldiers, I was banned from traveling and leaving the United States. Hmm. That was the reaction. All right, let me uh, pluck a question out of that. Sorry. People just, said that kind of thing. Sorry, go but, ahead. Yes, yeah, sure. I want to pluck a question out of that to go to Janice, which is, uh, I think one of the things that Ali's comments reflect is that in spite of what, in spite of a number of things that might ruin any other relationship in the world, the American-Saudi relationship seems to go on and seems to stay close regardless of all of these things. You know, why, um, I mean, I'm not going to ask why it is because it's obvious why it is, but do you think this latest chapter, potential Saudi support for ISIS, could have a negative impact on well, the relationship? Well, you know, it's, I, I think that Ali is really raising uh, an interesting point. Um, these are absolute monarchies, and they have very deep, what we call mukhabarat, secret police. Oil and, wells? Oh, no, sorry. secret Something police else. and intelligence services. Mm -hmm. And yes, they tell you all the time these are private sources, private charitable foundations, and they have no control. But that strains credulity, frankly. Now, what's happening? They, if they want to turn it of off, of course they could. they could. Of course they could. Mm -hmm. But and 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 so. What we're seeing here is a, is a pattern of support. It's not all financial. Uh, Turkey, for a long time, looked the other way as people crossed the border. Uh, Qatar was very helpful in building these networks. Uh, but I think, and we don't know because it's so difficult to get a, a, an accurate read recently, I think there is a change in Saudi Arabia because they now feel directly threatened um, by ISIS ideology. They come from the same root, as we've all said, mm -hmm. Wahhabi ideology. But ISIL and its propaganda has turned against the, the, the Saudi kings and said, you are, you know, you're not a true Muslim. In that and they said that about the new king? Well, they haven't said it about King Salman, but they certainly said it about King Abdullah. And to the extent they are saying that, that made not the US-Saudi relationship, because every Saudi king has been able to manage that relationship on the one hand while these activities have continued. But to the extent this becomes a direct threat to the Saudi ruling family, and they are squarely in the gun sights um, of ISIS, not in reality, but ideologically, Saudi Arabia may do more to stop the flow of funds. Hussein? And those are early indications. Hussein, could you add to that? 
Well, yeah, no, I think that I think that's right, uh, and I think that uh, there is an extent to which uh, people may well have thought that uh, encouraging Al Qaeda in Iraq was a good idea, and and even encouraging ISIS in Syria was a good idea, and possibly even. Uh, using ISIS as a tool against the al-Maliki government in Iraq was a good idea early on. And they must have lived to rue that day a long yeah. time ago. There's no way they haven't reconsidered that. And I don't dismiss the idea that there has been government support for ISIS or al-Qaeda in Iraq or anything like that. I just, you know, I want to be very careful about which government when and I want to know. I'm skeptical, for instance, about Jordan. But I mean, I do think that anyone who thought those things were good ideas must have thought twice. Ali, last word on this part? Uh, I think Jordan, uh, look who pardoned uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi and gave him a passport uh, to go to Afghanistan is King Abdullah of Jordan, three weeks after he took over. So Jordan is in, in, uh, deeply involved in this uh, as a government. Uh, you know, I think the problem has been in, in the region is that U.S. allies have been given a pass on their role in funding extremism. And you, that's why you see a lot of stories about this is a private issue. Uh, you know, it's not. It's state-supported, and it's really, you can see the, those, the actions of these terrorist groups uh, uh, coordinate very well with the foreign policy goals of the Saudi and other governments. And we know this because we are from the region. We know who are supporting ISIS and allowed to continue to work and fundraise. In Kuwait, if you tweet uh, in criticism of Saudi Arabia, you end up in jail for 10 years, 10 years. But you, if you fund uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, you get questioned and released, although you have pictures with, you, with a knife uh, and next to dead bodies. It's okay uh, for, for the Kuwaiti government. You are not uh, touched. But if you tweet something, criticism, you, uh, get your citizenship even gets revoked. And mm. this is the story in the Gulf countries. Okay. Lady and gentlemen, we've got uh, a little over five minutes to go, and I want to put one last thing on the table here. And that is some exploration of the notion that, well, let me put it in the words of the Egyptian president, because he touched in a recent television address on ISIS and the threat, and he concluded, the need for a unified Arab force is growing and becoming more pressing every day. Janice, to you first. Do you think ISIS finally represents the kind of threat that could get a grand alliance of Arab nations together to tackle it? No, no. Um, you know, we've never had a grand alliance, uh, a unified Arab military force, although many Arab leaders have dreamt of that at different points in the last 60 years. And I don't think that's coming now. Um, there are too many competing interests. If we look back just in the last two years, uh, and Ali alluded to this in a sense, you know, a bitter, bitter tension between Qatar on the one hand and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates on the other. They've ended up on, the, on, on different sides of the divide, and Qatar has been much more supportive of Turkey. These issues are going to continue. Uh, to dominate the area. What El Siti also said in that speech, Steve, it's interesting, is uh, the speech was given at Al-Aqsa University in Cairo, which is the seat of Islamic theology in the, in the Arab world. And he said, we need a revolution inside Islam. And he pointed his finger at the imams and he said, this is up to you. Um, there is, I think, more hope that those who uh, do not consider these literal readings of text, which is what this is, and it is not unique to Islam. We have literal readings of text in every religion. But those who do not consider this to be um, meaningful interpretations of Islam in the 21st century, that there are strong indications now that they are beginning in seats of learning and scholarship and in mosques that they are beginning to speak up. That's more likely. Hussein, let me get your view on whether ISIS represents the kind of threat that could lead to the creation of a grander alliance of Arab nations to take them on. Well, unfortunately not, uh, for a couple of different reasons. Number one, uh, there would be immediately a, uh, there's no mechanism, by the way, right. for, for creating such a force. I mean, who would, who, you know, what kind of a hierarchy, who would be in command of it? These are, these are not really resolvable issues. And Egypt, you know, is very focused on Libya. 
other uh, Arab states are very focused on Iraq. Everybody has in the back of their mind Syria, although nobody really wants to intervene in Syria because it's so difficult. So all of these are very, very complex problems. So I do think uh, that uh, ISIS is not uh, a grave enough threat, uh, although it's very grave, to, to prompt that and to overcome the differences that exist. And this is not even to get into uh, countries that don't agree at all. Uh, and so there are you know, even deeper divisions that Janice was mentioning. Uh, I, I think, by the way, that she's absolutely right, uh, Janice, is to, to bring up the question of, of uh, Sisi's call for a revolution in thought and a revolution in religious rhetoric. Uh, because what has emerged in the past few months is a bunch of calls like that. Sisi has gone further than anybody else, but uh, the, uh, the head of Al-Azhar University repeated this in, at a at counterterrorism conference in Saudi Arabia, and others have said it. There's a growing consensus in the mainstream among both political and religious leaders that something like this needs to happen. On the other hand, it's not happening. So uh, what is really going to be fascinating over the next year is whether that aspiration to create a change can be in any way um, action on uh, or realized in any way made practicable uh, or is it just going to be a dead aspiration because it's it's urgently needed and without that we really cannot go forward I think Ali I've actually got the quote here from the Egyptian president let me put it up on the screen and then I'll get you to comment further on it uh, Janice apropos of what you were just saying the president said I say and repeat again that we are in need of a religious revolution you imams are responsible before Allah. The entire world, I say it again, the entire world is waiting for your next move because this Islamic world is being torn, it is being destroyed, it is being lost, and it is being lost by our own hands. That is a fairly extraordinary thing for a political leader in that part of the world to say, Ali. Uh, what did you make of it when you heard it? I think he's right. We need a, a religious revolution in the Middle East. And I uh, always said that the, the problem is that it has to do even with technical parts. Meaning, if you look at the religious education or religious training, the training of religious leaders in the Middle East is so backward, it needs to be upgraded. The, most of the religious leaders in the Middle East, in the Arab world, are taught using books that are 900 years old. This should stop. Al-Azhar itself, in Saudi Arabia, in Iran, in Iraq, these religious schools must be you must, you know, dispose of this old style of, of learning and, uh, you know, modernize that, 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 that process in order to get something that is modern in, in the way of thinking. And that includes the textbooks, which I am an expert on. The Saudi school books are, are for example, a, an example of that. Why you have a lot of terrorists from those regions? Because the religious education is backward and it has not, it, it, nothing to do with modern. Uh, however, I think that the reason that Mr. Abdel Fattah Sisi is doing this because he wants to uh, become relevant as, a, as an Arab leader, the new Nasser. And I think that is one of his ways to try to take the helm of the Arab uh, uh, street and the Arab world. Uh, he's, not going to be, uh, he's not going to get a lot of traction from the Saudis who think they are their leaders. So this is not going to uh, go far in terms, of, uh, in terms of ISIS. I think it's a huge threat. It is the, the largest armed group in the history of the Middle East that has territorial gains. No one else before them in the history of the Middle East since uh, 100 years ago who have captured so much territory, who have inflicted so much damage more than them. So they are a long-term threat specifically because they are state-supported and will continue to benefit from the Saudis. The notion that the Saudis are scared of them is false because they continue to work together uh, to achieve similar goals. Okay, let me f just finish off on the religious angle here. Uh, Hussein, I'll ask you, do you think Egypt is in a position to lead this religious revolution that the president referred to? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, it, it's one of the most decisive of the Arab states, uh, but it can't do it alone. Uh, its power comes from two different sources. One is its enormous population. Uh, something a little bit more than a third, a little bit less than a half of, of the Arabs are Egyptians. I mean, it's it's just a huge group of Arabs. So um, you start there with a very big pool. Second is the enormous cultural influence that Egypt has, which partly is historical and partly comes from that uh, population and the fact that it produces a great deal of uh, uh, of cultural pr production, uh, TV, movies, books, etc. It's just very it's a cultural powerhouse in the Arab world, but 
without support from uh, Gulf states and from other powerful large states and, and from religious institutions and others, on its own, Egypt can't do it. It might be able to produce a change of thinking in Egypt over uh, decades, but uh, to lead the whole region requires a broader uh, cooperation. And I think there's a big question mark about both. Janice. No, just, just to follow up on, on your comment, Hussein, um, what we really need is we don't need Egypt to lead the religious revolution. What we actually need is some pluralism in religious voices, oh, right? Yes. And to the extent that Egypt, that Al-Aqsar University in, in Cairo weighs in a very serious way, there will be competition uh, with, with, with uh, imams in Saudi Arabia. But what we need is a plurality of voices, and to the extent that, we, which we really you know, do not speak right now with great force, to the extent that we get a pluralism of religious voices, ISIS claims become just one of many rather than the authoritative voice of the true Islam. And as soon as they lose that mantra, they've lost. Okay, Janice, you sit tight because we're going to keep our focus on Egypt in the remaining moments in our program. In the meantime, can we thank Hussein Ibish from the American Task Force on Palestine and Ali Al Ahmed from the Institute for Gulf Affairs. We're grateful both of you could join us on TVO tonight. Thank Thanks so much. much. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.